Well, good morning. It's a real pleasure to be with you. I have a few minutes to uh, proceed at warp speed to talk a little bit about my perspectives and experiences and how it informs the discussion on technology and investment for the future. There are two pictures here, one of when I was an astronaut. I was with NASA for nearly 30 years. But after I left NASA, I became the president and CEO of the Museum of Flight in Seattle, Washington. We like to call it the Smithsonian of the West. Aviation and space, and there I learned a lot about the history of aviation, more about the history of space, but also how that all interplayed into commercial development. And I want to share some of those perspectives with you. First of all, we need to recognize the universe is a big place. I think you all know that. We're in one galaxy, the Milky Way, uh, but we, Hubble has shown us that there are billions and billions of galaxies out there. So I like to say, so much to see, so little time. And this is about exploration. Exploration was sort of in my DNA. My grandparents immigrated from Scotland to uh, Oregon in the United States, and that's my grandmother and grandfather. That's where they lived. And that little place in Oregon, uh, the one-room schoolhouse there that my, grand or my father went to actually produced in the United States two Nobel Prize winners, which tells me it's what you put up here, not always what you're surrounded with. But they had a one-way ticket on a ship around 1903 to come to the United States. The exploration was in their blood. It was certainly in my grandfather's blood because when he was growing up in Dundee, Scotland, he watched the discovery, the ship that took Captain Robert Scott to the Antarctic, he watched it being built there in the harbor. That ship returned, it's been restored, and it was an innovation in technology. Talk about composites and multi-layered materials that wintered twice in the ice of Antarctica. In addition, uh, it had its own laboratory to look at the magnetic fields of Antarctica, so there are no metals in that lab. It's really a marvel of technology. In fact, one of our shuttles was named after it. Well, my parents also homesteaded. Well, in the United States, that means you start with nothing, with a tent to a place that hadn't been farmed or ranched before, and that's where I grew up. So I grew up in this spirit of exploration and curiosity and looking for the unknown and not a lot around me. <laughs> and being very self-sufficient. So these are pictures that are still relevant to my youth. And the lower left-hand corner is what we call a post office. Out in the middle of nowhere, it's still there. My parents taught me self-sufficient and how to take a little risk. That's my father behind me, um, less than a year old, on the top of our favorite bull. And I take this out to school now, and I often get teachers say, well, wasn't your mother horrified at this risk your father was exposing you to? And I say, no, who do you think was taking the picture? As my dad said, look, no hands <laughs> on the top of that bull. So exploration can be risky, but it starts with an inspiration. I want to go someplace. And then you have to develop the technology to help you get there, that enabling R&D. And for many, as, as Dan was saying, for many environments, uh, you, you start with either an institution or a government who's, who can take on that risk but you develop technologies. And those technologies have a cyclic um, nature to them. They, you learn about the environment, like the vacuum of space. You then build spacecraft that can support humans. That technology becomes part of the mainstream. It informs commercial development. And then there's a feedback loop all the way there. So whether you're talking about the ships of the last 200 years, and yesterday was fun to hear about the, the automatic uh, robotic ships, or you're talking about aviation or space, communications, or space navigation, or space weather, or even, uh, as we'll hear a little bit later, on uh, remote sensing. Uh, you start someplace, you inform the, the, um, the technology. The Wright brothers experienced this as well. Two engineers, bicycle engineers, developed uh, the, the airplane, the Wright Flyer. Think about it, only 112 years ago. and it only took me 24 total hours to get here on this flight. Uh, but when the airplane was first developed, that 1903 flight, it flew 10 feet up, distance of 120 feet. Press coverage was really positive about the risk they were taking, but really negative for public transport. No one would ever buy a ticket on an airplane. Safety assessment, dangerous. First sale, U.S. Army two-page contract. And it was the government after World War I who established the National Advisory Committee on Aviation to invest in technology and also started the airmail in the United States. And look at what we have now, airplanes like the Boeing 787 Dreamliner with its composites and advanced technology or the Airbus airplanes. 
Well, one of my favorite heroes was Robert Goddard, who in 1887 uh, envisioned going to Mars, and out of that became a physicist, and eventually published in the field and started his rocket research with liquid-fueled rockets. I'll talk a little bit more about him later, but he was definitely a visionary, and he pushed the technology uh, forward. But it was Sputnik in 1957 that I noticed as a young girl growing up in that rural area and watching it go over. And later, the next year, we launched Explore, and we listened to President Eisenhower actually talk from that satellite. Sputnik was a beep, 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 but the Explorer had a continuous uh, radio signal. President Kennedy then committed us to the moon in 1962 when we just barely orbited the Earth with John Glenn. And he committed us to investing in research and technology, and he had an insight as to the advantages and the rewards of doing that, how it would build our science and technology for the future. 1969, when I was an undergraduate at the University of Washington, we watched Neil Armstrong walk on the moon. And we actually landed six times and 12 men walked on the moon, and we saw our first vision of the Earth. And out of that vision came many of the research thrusts in the United States, mission to planet Earth, remote sensing, an understanding that we had to understand the, the weather in our oceans and the geology. Voyager was launched in 1977 and has now gone farther than any other of our probes. It's, you know, has escaped our solar system and we still follow it. But my involvement in space, real involvement, became as a young engineer working on the space shuttle. First as an undergraduate at the University of Washington, where during the summers I studied in the materials science department, engineering department, and worked on the thermal protection materials that might be used for the shuttle. The first reusable vehicle being designed. Launch like a rocket, land like an airplane. We hadn't done that before. The Apollo vehicles, the Mercury and Gemini vehicles, they were all covered with a material that burned up as the vehicle came back in the Earth's atmosphere. It was ablative, one-time use. The vision was is that we could create, not only create a vehicle that was reusable, but would be able to bring back the experiments we spend to send to space. So many principal investigators, so many scientists were sending their instruments or their experiments up on a one-way trip. So the shuttle revolutionized what we could do in, in space and really made the International Space Station a reality. So I was thrilled to death after my graduation to actually go to work for a company building the shuttle, Rockwell International. I worked on the thermal protection systems and that's where I first applied to be an astronaut while I was there. I was selected for physicals. I went down to the Johnson Space Center, uh, one of the final 100. But at that time, I was not selected. That's OK. They hired me as a flight controller. And so I worked on the Skylab reentry because we couldn't bring that back down to Earth. That was our space station. But I did apply again and was selected for the class of 1980 along with 18 other people and two Europeans, as a matter of fact. I had the privilege of flying on five crews during my space shuttle career from 1985 to 1998. All of them science missions, two docking missions to the Russian space station Mir. Launching on the shuttle was a, an amazing experience. From time that the countdown clock is at zero to the time we're in space, eight minutes. Orbiting the Earth once every 90 minutes, 17,500 miles per hour, or Mach 25. And then each time that we re-entered, and several times I was on the flight deck, I was amazed at how well those tiles worked. I was very proud to have been part of that. The shuttle's payload bay, or cargo bay, is what made it the workhorse of space. 135 flights with five vehicles, and its last uh, major accomplishment was assembling and resupplying the International Space Station. But the shuttle was also our first venture into international collaboration. The space lab you see in the payload bay there, that was designed by the European Space Agency. They built two of them for the shuttle. We flew it, I think, 13, 14 times. The robotic arm, that was contracted to the Canadian Space Agency, CSA, called the Remote Manipulator System. We involved Japan in, in their first science mission uh, with the space lab on the shuttle. And then we started docking with Russia. That was another part of that international venture that was so important to informing what we do now on the International Space Station. 
just a picture inside that laboratory because I'm asked this question quite often. The variable you cannot replicate here on the Earth is weightlessness. And if you're dealing with fluids, liquids, or gases where you have no natural convection, diffusion dominates, surface tension dominates, you cannot create that environment here. If we're going to explore beyond Earth orbit in a weightless environment, we need to develop life support systems for the humans, and they'll depend upon the knowledge that we're gaining here. Same with the health of our astronauts. I had the privilege of docking the first time with the Russian space station in 1995, and then again on the eighth docking flight in 1998. I trained with my Russian colleagues over in Star City, along with other international crews. We were, I learned to be part of a really great team. I think the aerospace industry, like many industries, creates great teams because we work together for success and we also share the failures. They're very visible. Uh, we're part of the engineering team, part of designing. We bring back information and data that the engineers on the ground, on the surface of the Earth, don't have. The 89 flight was uh, pivotal for me. It was my last flight. Uh, it was also second to the last docking flight to the International Space Station, or to um, Mir. But we are also testing technologies for the International Space Station as well. And again, I got to fly the flight deck on reentry. And this is just an artist's concept, because you'll never see this, of the tiles protecting the shuttle from temperatures of 2,300 degrees Fahrenheit and other materials up to 2,700 degrees Fahrenheit. It's a glider when it lands, so the precision of the deorbit burn is important. That depends where you're going to land. And we've so far managed to land exactly where we wanted to land each time. Every landing that we, we actually uh, accomplished either in Florida and California and once in New Mexico were perfect landings and the shuttle survived for another flight. Well, my last flight, January 28th, the landing date, uh, was a few months before we started designing the International Space Station. And it was a little bit bittersweet. I didn't get to fly on the space station. Um, I'm going to see if this runs here. Apparently not. So, but we now have this space station, a football field wide, orbiting us right now. And of course, you can go to the website and find out exactly when it's coming over Singapore. And it's as bright as Venus. It's the brightest thing in your sky. Every school kid ought to go out and take a look at it, every adult, because right now there are six people up there. And the research that's being accomplished on the space station is going to inform exploration. It's going to inform commercial development of space. The pictures taken of the Earth uh, inform uh, our, our scientists in meteorology, geology, and oceanography. And you can see many more stars. Can't all see them on that image. I see them on this screen here. Carl Sagan was right. It's billions and billions and billions of stars. And it is truly an international venture. And I hope that we have space stations in Earth orbit forever, because that is the next stake. That will help us enable commercial development and beyond. And what's beyond? Well, I'd like to go back to the moon for engineering reasons. We ought to have a a platform there, a, a, an outpost like we do in Antarctica now. We've been in, our, in our Antarctica, Antarctica for a little over 100 years, and the moon ought to be next. Mars, Curiosity is paving the way for future exploration. Discovered there used to be water, and of course there were active volcanoes on Mars as well. Maybe in 20 years there'll be a Martian base. So as the United States and NASA looks to the future, we're still looking at the development of technologies that enable it. Uh, this exploration technologies that also fuel and feed into commercial space. I had the opportunity last September to visit the Chinese space program in Beijing, uh, meet with 10 of the Taikonauts, two of them women, see their model of a space station that they want to put up in 2020, and look at a mural where they show uh, Chinese Taikonauts walking on the surface of the moon. Exploration is not a question of if, it's just a question of when and who who has the imagination, who has the image, who will invest in the technology. That's been true since the time of the pyramids. And I look forward, I hope, for as long as I live and the next hundred years as to the things that we can accomplish. Robert Goddard was not acclaimed in his lifetime. In fact, people said that what he was thinking about was impossible. But even at 17, he knew different. 
If you visit the Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland, you'll see engraved on many stones there, who is to say what is impossible? For it's the dreams of yesterday that are the hopes of today that become the realities of tomorrow. Those are the words of Robert Goddard. Thank you very much.